Hi, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use, and also our own cultural stories and perspectives growing up in the U.S. in a Persian family. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to episode 73. Today, we are going to be talking about how to grow sabze, Persian grass, to set up your half-seen table. I'm joined by two amazing women, as per usual, my partner, Bita June, along with a very special guest we have today, Naz Devarian. Hi, Naz. Hi, nice to be with you. We're so happy to have you. So Naz is an award-winning writer with a beautiful blog. The International Association of Culinary Professionals has awarded it as the best narrative culinary blog, along with a lovely cookbook, Bottom of the Pot, which I personally have read cover to cover. It is just so much more than a cookbook. The descriptions are like no other cookbook I've ever seen. And the reason that we're sitting down today is because I have come to think of you as the Sabza expert, Naz June. <laughs> so Bita June turned me on to your sort of tutorials on Instagram with the step-by-step of how to grow Sabza. Thank you so much, Nazjun, for joining us on our show. I've been following you for a long time. I had the opportunity to meet you in one of your events here in San Francisco. I have your lovely cookbook signed to me and that I hold very precious and close to my heart. So thank you for all of that. As Bita said, we're honored to have you on our show. We thought it would be a really great opportunity to teach our listeners more about Persian New Year. For everyone who's listening, we had a three-part series last year where we covered some of the events leading up to Nuru's like the Charshan Basuri and some of the rituals that go into that and setting up the half scene and then rounding it out with like Siza Bidat and some of the activities that we participate during that time. So if anyone wants to listen to that, those are episodes 22, 23, and 24 from last year. But we thought that maybe this year we can hone in on the Sabze in particular because you do such a great job on Instagram. I followed it. I made it for the first time a handful of years ago and it turned out green and luscious and I was very, very proud of myself. And actually my friends and family were really proud of me too for being able to make my own Sabze. So this episode is gonna come out just in time for our listeners to get their lentils and get their beans and participate in this. And hopefully all of them can follow you on social media on Instagram, bottom of the pot, and can follow along and make sabze for themselves for their half seen this year. Thank you both so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. And thank you for doing this, for introducing people with our culture and food, and just providing the space to talk about these things. So I don't know that I consider myself a sabze expert, but <laughs> we do. We definitely do. <laughs> Thank you. But I know that I started sharing my Sabze journey on Instagram a few years ago because as many Iranians know, and I think this happens to many of us, is that growing Sabze can be very Mm -hmm. (laughs) anxiety-inducing. At least it was for me. Sure. Growing up in an Iranian household, there was always this worry of when to start sprouting, the sabze, how long would it last? Oh my gosh, will it grow? Will it not grow? Will it get green? Will it not? And there was all this anxiety around it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share that with my little Instagram community so we could all go through this together. I didn't want to suffer alone. (laughs) So that's how it really came about, why I started sharing it. And it has just grown into this really, really wonderful annual tradition that we now have. And I'm very thankful for it. Mm -hmm. So as your listeners probably know, Iranians, along with other nationalities and ethnic groups, celebrate the vernal equinox, which we call Noruz, meaning new day, and it's a celebration of the first day of spring. And it's, in my opinion, a lovely new year. That's, you know, it's all about 
rebirth and new mm-hmm. life and greens, which shows up in the dishes that we serve and in our traditional ritual of setting up a half seen table, which is our sofre half seen, which is the table that we set up with the seven symbolic items, beginning with the Persian letter S. Right. Beautiful. Sabze with the S is one of them. Sabze coming from the word sabz, which is again green. And you'll see iterations of this all throughout Noru's tradition. So in the green herb rice, in the kuku sabzi, which is sabz again. So sabze is one of them. And It's a lovely ritual because everyone, you know, your children can be involved and you can observe the growth of life from a little, little seed. Dried seed, yeah. Dried seed that you could never imagine anything could happen with this, except if you grew up maybe in the 80s and 90s and you had the chia pet thing that you could could water and grow, Mm -hmm. or if you were Iranian and you grew sabzit. It's the greens, right? It's the shooting of new life. You're literally growing new life in celebration of this occasion. So it's new life, rebirth. To me, it's really just life. Yeah, life. I agree. And I think that's really beautiful. I love how it also crosses over in other cultures and religions and the springtime and you see, you know, Easter grass. So I think that's what's so beautiful about these traditions is that you'll see them echo each other. So Mm -hmm. be it Noruz, Easter, there's echoes of new life, of new beginnings, celebration, right? And it depends on when Easter falls, but this year it's going to be a little bit ways down from Noruz. But I say sometimes if you want at the very end, if it coincides with Easter, you can use your sabza clippings to fill the baskets. Oh, how cute. For the kids of Easter to, for them to put their eggs in. So if it, your sabza makes it that long <laughs> and it coincides. Right. So back to the sabza, there are different kinds of sabza that you can grow. So what we're essentially doing is we're sprouting. Mm -hmm. And that has also become very popular to consume sprouted legumes or sprouted wheats. And that's really what we're doing. We're sprouting, be it lentils, or you can sprout barley. You can, another very, very popular sabza is made out of wheat. And Mm -hmm. you can sprout wheat, or you can use mung beans. You can have fun with this and you can experiment. I can't guarantee that they will all work, but this is possible. Last year I did chia seeds and they are really cute. They come out almost like clovers on top. Absolutely. I think chia seeds, the sprouts, the green shoots are very similar to the lentil shoots, whereas the wheat, it really looks like grass, right? It looks like blades of grass. The reason that I like to sprout lentils is because I find it's easier than sprouting the wheat. Mm -hmm. The wheat is a little moodier when you're (laughs) growing it. It needs a little more care. And for me personally, I want something a little more hands-off. I'm already worrying about my sabze. I don't want to worry more about mold and wheat. It's been known that it can get a little moldy and smelly. So if you like to grow wheat, by all means, I recommend it. You can do it. I like to do the lentils and I can be a little bit more hands-off with it and not worry so much. So last year was a unique year as it has been the past Mm -hmm. almost three years have been unique for all of us around the globe. Last Nooroos in particular was unique for us because we moved to Vancouver for about four months. We were there from Yalda. And so we saw the winter solstice through in Vancouver. And then we got to welcome Nooroos in Vancouver. Wow. And what was very interesting about that for me was growing sabze. I have been living in Los Angeles for the past 20 plus years. So the light and the warmth and the climate here is very different than Vancouver, which was in the dead of winter, not as much light. And interestingly, we can get into this, but my sabze grew differently. Like the texture of the sabze was different which I found very interesting. And last year was the first year that we had cats. 
So that was interesting too, <laughs> trying to keep the Sabza away from the cats. It got trampled on a couple of times. Ultimately, Sabza is pretty hardy. That's another thing that I learned. And it survived the interest of the cats. So there's that too. <laughs> so fun. Okay, so what are we doing? I'm going to concentrate on lentils. And people ask this of me on Instagram a lot about the wheat. So if what we're talking about right now is lentils. Okay. And this would apply to, let's say, mung beans too. It would work for mung beans too. Or something like like a legume like that. And you could just get the regular ones like from the grocery store? Regular ones from the grocery store. Because there are a lot of varieties. We did a lentil episode. Yeah. There's the tiny ones. There's the black ones. There's the green ones. There's there's a lot of different types of lentils. You know, someone once asked me about red lentils. I have not tried my hand at red lentils. Now, red lentils, I don't know that they would work because they've already been cracked. That's what red lentils are. And the skin is off of them. So I don't know that that would work necessarily. But don't quote me on that. I haven't tried it. But what we're talking about is just regular green or brown lentils from the grocery stores. Okay. I don't use the tiny French ones. I use like the regular sized ones. Regular size. Okay. Yeah. I would recommend that you not use, you know, a sack of lentils that has been sitting in the back of the pantry for two years. You kind of want, we're celebrating new life. So if possible, just buy a new little bag from the fresh. grocery store. Fresh, yeah. As fresh as they can be when they're dry and in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what we do first is I use about a cup, a cup of dry lentils. Okay. And I go through it. And, you know, sometimes there's like little stones or something. And mm -hmm. you just want to pick through it and pick those out. And then you, all you need is a bowl to soak your lentils in. And then you need a thin dishcloth, like a flour sack. You can use paper towels as well, but if you, you know, it's preferable if you could just use something reusable, like a dishcloth, that would be better. And the vessel you grow the sabs in can really be anything you want it to be, however you want it to look. I use a pie plate. It's kind of flat. I like the way that it has a rim so it keeps the bottom part intact. But really, you can use any pretty vessel that you like, as long as you have space. And to that point, as we look forward to setting out our half scene, you can start visualizing what kind of place setting you want to have, or if there's like different plates or bowls that you want to use, you can start making your sabze in something that matches with the other things that are going to go on the sofre. Exactly. So you have your dry lentils. The first step is we have to sprout these lentils. And the way to do that is to, you have to soak them in water. So we have to think about when Nowruz is. For instance, this year it's on March 20th, Sunday, March 20th, I believe at 8.33 in the morning, West Coast time. Yes. So I count back 14 days because over time, having done this year after year, in my climate, in my home, it takes me about 14 days to grow my sabze to a really lush and full sabze. Now, having said that, Noru's lasts 13 days. So many mm -hmm. believe that, well, but you want the sabze to then last another 13 days, right? So this wholly depends on the family, on your personal preferences. Mm -hmm. I like to have a fully grown, lush sabze on my half scene table for the hour when we bring in the new year for Sol Tahvil. Also because being here in Los Angeles, we don't do a lot of Eididani, so my house isn't full of people coming and going for 13 days. So sometimes mm -hmm. my half scene table doesn't even stay up for the 13 mm -hmm. days. Sure. So it really depends on how you're celebrating Nowruz. If you want a lush sabze for your very first day, I would say start 14 days ahead of time. If you want to wait a couple of days so that your sabze stays green throughout the 13-day celebration, you know, start a couple of days later. Okay, great. 
So incidentally, if our listeners are listening live, this broadcasts on the 23rd of this month of February, and they will have perfectly a week to gather supplies and, you know, get everything ready and basically have plenty of time. Plenty of time. And on Instagram, I usually post a few days ahead, kind of giving the heads up. Hey, we're going to do this again. If you want to gather your lentils, a bowl and a platter and a dishcloth, that's really and maybe a spritzer. That's all you need. So I will give a little heads up so everyone can be ready. Okay, so we have our dry lentils. Uh We're soaking them about the first three days until you start seeing tiny, tiny little sprouts poking through the lentil. Okay. And you'll start to see the skin of the lentil start cracking as well. Those first three days, you want to change that water. You want to keep it fresh. So you just tip the water out and then cover it with cold water again. Those are the first three days. Like once a day is fine for that? I do once a day. I think once a day is fine for whatever reason, if your house is particularly warm and hot and you start to smell the lentils a little bit, sure, you can tip. And if it's starting to really get like musty a little or, Mm -hmm. you know, the water is not looking great, sure, you can do it twice a day. Okay. But typically once a day is great. Great. So that's the first three days. And you should, by the third day, you should start seeing the little sprouts. If you don't, that's okay. Do not panic. Keep going. Go another day or so. Go another day or so. Okay. So then after the third day, what we do is then we tip all the water out. And that's when you want to have that dishcloth or whatever ready. I just use the platter that I'm going to use eventually to grow my sabze. But Uh at this point, it can be anything. It can be a plate. It can be a bowl, whatever you want it to be. You line that plate or platter, let's say, with a dishcloth. You put the newly sprouted lentils All of them. So it's not going to be one single layer. And that's another point I get asked a lot. Does this need to be in one single layer? The answer is no. You do not want this to be one single layer. They need to be on top of each other. And you place the lentils on top of that. And then you kind of cover it with your cloth. Or you can use a paper towel. At this point, we're going to keep that cloth or paper towel, whatever it is, we want to keep it damp for about another three days. Okay. When I say damp, I don't mean soaking wet. (laughs) It's it's really, you kind of have to get a feel for it. There's really no way of being precise about this, but you want to keep it damp enough so it starts shooting. Okay you're going to start seeing little green shoots, which is just really a beautiful process. And the kids love it. Little kids love this process. You get to watch life, you know, from this little lentil seed. So this is where the troubleshooting begins is because if it gets too wet, you're going to get moldy. If it's too dry, it's not going to grow. So you want to kind of keep it balanced. So that's about the second set of three days. So it has a cloth underneath it and then a cloth or a paper towel on top of it. And those are both damp. Should there be any water at the bottom of that vessel of that plate or whatever? Or is it just damp cloths? The damp cloth. You don't want that vessel to be waterlogged. Okay, great. Right? So if it is, you want to tip it out. But you do want it to be damp. I never used to cover the top. I think it turns out you do need to cover the top. I never did it and my sabza grew every year, (laughs) but just so we're all on one page, this year I'm going to cover the top, everyone cover the top so I don't have to (laughs) do this thing of, well, I didn't do it and you know what I mean? Yeah. We're covering the top. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So this is about the second set of three days. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to start seeing little, little green shoots. You might see it on the, you know, sixth day. Somebody else might see it on the seventh day. Somebody else might see it on the fifth day. We just have to work with what we have. Sure. At that point, your lentils are going to start growing roots on the bottom. That's what we want as well. So at that point, we're going to gently transfer from the cloth onto whatever platter that you're using, be it one platter, two, if you're dividing, however you want to do it. Okay. So... Now the lentils are sitting on our platter 
with nothing underneath, so no cloth. Okay. But a damp cloth or paper towel on top. Okay. You want to either spritz with cold water, or you can use the shower function, the spray function on your tap. You could do that. Like me, being lazy, you can just sprinkle it with your fingers like my mom used to do it, dip her fingers in a bowl of water and just sprinkle, sprinkle. Yeah, the authentic way to do it. <laughs> That's how I did it. And then one day it occurred, my husband, I think, was like, why don't you just use a spray bottle? <laughs> I was like, huh, there is an idea. But sure, that takes some of the guesswork out of it too. If you have a spray bottle, you can just kind of do a few spritzes of it and it's not like this. Like, well, how much water on your hands are you doing? Please, yes, use a spray bottle. Don't be like me. Just get a spray bottle and use a spray <laughs> bottle. And then people say, how often do I spray it? Or I work, so I leave in the morning and I'm not home until the evening. We can work around all this. So you want to spray it enough to keep everything damp Mm -hmm. not soaked, not dry. It's this happy medium, damp. Now, you don't have a Sabza babysitter throughout the day to spray it. I would suggest you give it a good spray in the morning and then don't leave it in a dry spot in the house at this point because it's going to dry out quickly. So don't mm. put it in front of the sun or don't put it next to the furnace or the radiator or something because it'll dry out quickly mm -hmm. if you're someone who can't keep up with it. So out of those sprouts, you're going to start seeing green shoots and those baby tiny green shoots. That's what we're looking for. And when you start seeing enough of a green shoot, that's when we're going to uncover it and then starts what I call chasing the light because this is when you want to chase the sun. The sun is going to help your sabza grow. That's my favorite part. I love chasing the sun. I'm yeah, clearly not an too. expert, but my sprouts did okay last year is go ahead and talk to them. Now these are your babies. They're growing. <laughs> it helps. Yeah, I can imagine. That's become a tradition around our house, you know, throughout the years. And my kids are getting older now. So, you know, it's interesting to go back and watch what we did every year. But when they were younger, you know, they would tell them jokes. <laughs> oh my God, so cute. They would play cards with them, you know. Hey, Sabze, <laughs> one for you. My husband reads to the Sabze. You know, we Aww. sing to the Sabze. That is adorable. Look, it's whether it works or not, it's the joy that it brings, mm -hmm. the ritual brings. And I think that's the most important thing. And it's really, really fun. Mm -hmm. So from this point on, we've taken the cover off or the, if you're using a paper towel or your fabric, it's off. And what we're doing is we're chasing the sun. We want sunlight. So you want to put your sabze, you're going to move around the house. As the sun moves, we're going to move around the house throughout the day. And what you'll start noticing is hopefully you're getting green shoots that are starting to go straight up and they're going to start leaning, bending towards the sun, reaching for the mm -hmm. sun. Yes. That's so beautiful. I love that part. What has been beautiful about this process is that it has connected me to people around the world. I've gotten messages from people in Norway saying, I'm in the depths of winter. I have no sun. I'm in the dark. It's cold. What do I do? And we talk through it. I haven't had that experience, so I can't really say. But there are things that you can do. Well, you've been in Canada. Yes. Yeah, so what I found, what happened to our Sabze in Canada, and this could have been either climate related or just the lentils themselves. In LA, my shoots are very delicate and very green and light. In Canada, they were hearty. They were sturdy wow. and hearty, which <laughs> I thought was very symbolic I love because it, it mm -hmm. felt like it was winter, it was cold, and these shoots needed to be sturdy and hearty to withstand mm -hmm. the cats. <laughs> they knew there were cats around. <laughs> I love it. So what did you say to your follower in Norway? What advice did you give them? So what you want to do is if you have a heat source, like a furnace or something like that, 
you can put the sabze closer to the heat stores so it's getting warmth. As far as okay. light goes, I know that people have written me over the years and they're using artificial light, mm -hmm. like a greenhouse light. You know, you can use artificial light and that has worked as well. So that's the best we can do, right? So, okay, great. Yeah. And this can go for, you don't have to be in Norway. If you're in a particularly cold climate, you want to put your sabze closer to a heat source without drying it out. So that's another mm -hmm. thing. Like you want it to be closer to the heat source, but you also don't want to kill it. You don't want to dry it out. If you're in a really hot place, a warm and a light filled environment, and if it's growing too fast, then what you want to do is keep it away from the light and the warmth and just kind of keep it in a cooler spot. Oh. So you can play around. Oh, interesting. What you want to do throughout, though, is you have to keep watering it. It's very, very important that you keep watering it. But you, again, you don't want to soak it, but you do want to keep it down. Okay. And what another tip is what I do is at this point when I start getting the green shoots, I'll actually bring it to the sink and I'll use the spray function. Mm -hmm. But then I'll tip the whole plate slightly to get rid of the excess water that's sitting at the bottom of your platter. Okay. And that's how you might get some moldy stuff happening if it's too wet at the bottom. Okay. So drain out the excess liquid. Drain out the excess liquid without losing your sabze. Be careful, like put your hand in front of it so your sabze, all of it, because it will slip out. Like the whole thing can yeah. slip out and you don't want <laughs> oh, that no. to happen. Like just very gently tip it out. And then you're ready, hopefully by Salat Ahvil, by the first day, your sabze is beautiful and, and ready to go. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think this is wonderful. Our listeners are going to follow along and hopefully thousands of sabzas are going to be sprouting all around the world. After you've had your sabza on the table and enjoyed Noruz, does your family do the tradition of what you do with the sabza when you're finished with it? Yes. Yeah, so hopefully your sabze will be beautiful and green for the 13 days. And remember, throughout the 13 days, you're still watering that sabze. Otherwise, oh, it's, right. it's going to dry out. Don't forget about it. You're not done. Your job babysitting the sabze is not done. As your listeners know, and as you mentioned, Bito Jun, you've covered this on the podcast. So the 13th day is Sizda mm -hmm. And that is traditionally a day that we don't stay indoors. We go outdoors. That's the last day of Noru celebrations. And we have a picnic and we celebrate the last day. And you want to do this outdoors. So what you do traditionally is you take your sabze, you take two sabze shoots and you can tie them together and make a wish or you can make a wish and tie two grass blades together outside if you're at a park if you don't have sabze that's what my kids do and you make a wish for the new year but you've done this with your sabze and traditionally then you release the sabze without the platter, it'll come right off. It's all kind of stuck together at that point. At that point, the roots have all stuck together. The lentils are all pretty much roots now, and it's all one big clump. And you can gently lift it, lift the whole thing off of your platter, and you release it into a body of water, typically a stream, a river, which is a really, really beautiful tradition. Having said that, for environmental reasons, <laughs> you know, it might not be the best idea where you live now, depending on where you are and what your body of water is. So if you can, and it's not an environmental concern, you can release the sabza, which the image of that, it is so beautiful to see this, this sabza that you put so much love and care into, and now you're releasing it back into nature, mm -hmm. back to where it came from. So pretty. Now, if you don't have a body of water, if like us, your LA river is unfortunately dried up, we give it right back to nature in form of compost. Can you eat it? Not on that 13th day. No, you're done Not with Not on that. the 13th day, okay. <laughs> don't eat it on that, that, that sabs has been through a bit. When you can eat it, obviously, if your listeners you know, know of sprouting, 
legumes. Mm -hmm. You can use it in salads, Mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. You can put sprouted lentils in your soups. If you wanted to, those initial days that you're soaking the lentils, you can then take a few and eat those. I wrote a piece for the San Francisco Chronicle two years ago about my wonderful friend Hanif Saad, Chef Hanif Saad Mm -hmm. of Comage in San Francisco. And he has this beautiful half seen salad. It's such a beautiful idea. And what he has done is taken these components of the half seen and created the salad out of it. And he uses the sprouts, the lentil sprouts. Yeah in that salad. It's so creative. I made one last year. It's delicious. It's so beautiful. So you could eat it in the first few days of sprouting. Okay. But then once you're like fully in, then it's done. You're done with it. It's just for decorative purposes and for the purpose of it being a symbolic item on the half seen table. It's really nutritious too, by the way, if you decide to eat your half seen. (laughs) (laughs) Very, very nutritious. Lentils are so good for you and in anything sprouted. Yeah. I know that we joke that it's stressful and anxiety inducing, and that's part of the fun of it. And that's why I thought it would be fun to share on Instagram and we could all go through it together. If your sabza doesn't sprout, it's fine. It really, really is okay. We have so much to be concerned about in this world right now that the sabza growing shouldn't really be a part of it. If you live in a city or in an area where you have access to an Iranian market, They're growing sabze, selling already grown sabze around Noru's. No problem. Go and buy one and enjoy it. And if not, you know, wheatgrass from juice stores. Yes. Right. It's sabze. (laughs) Yeah. And it's beautiful. I actually do that quite often. Yeah. And it's nice and lush and full. And you can put a pretty little ribbon around it and make it match the rest of your half scene. And then make wheatgrass and drink it. Yeah, and then make juice afterwards. <laughs> but Najun, thank you so much for sharing the steps. This is something that I know that our listeners are going to love. So thank you for taking the time to teach us and walk us through all those steps. We have a question for you. For this year, for your half scene, is there anything that you have already started thinking about, like what your half scene is going to look like this year? When it comes to the half scene, I stay kind of to what I do every year. I have my sofre, which was my mother's, which has been in the family for like 250 years or so, this piece of cloth. So I generally just stick to what we do every year. Once again, I don't know what's going to happen for Nooruz this year. I don't know if it's just going to be the four of us again, or if we can expand our circle a little more and you know have friends and family over, I don't know. So what I've learned in the past two years is that the most important thing is to just be flexible about it and really be grateful that even if it is just the four of us, the core of, of our family, then that's what it's gonna have to be and we'll zoom in family from Canada and elsewhere. I personally am super inspired. We'd love for our listeners to be able to follow you. So please let us all know what is the best way to find you, Nazjun. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun for me and it's inspired me again. And now I'm excited looking forward to Noruz and growing our Sabze again. You can find me on Instagram at bottom of the pot. I'm on Twitter at bottom of the pot one, the number one. I am frequently contributing to New York Times cooking, so you can find some recipes and a few pieces here and there, articles in New York Times food section. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. Best wishes for a happy and healthy and prosperous no ruse to you. Aida Shamomobarak. And we look forward to our listeners growing Sabze, setting out their half scene and tagging you and us on it so we can be a part of their journey as well. Thank you. Until next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Modern Persian Food Podcast with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling a friend or giving us a good rating. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com or on Instagram for the recipes and information we talked about today. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.